Welcome to Creator Talks. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. We are now entering March, and February was a great month for our guests on the show, and March is going to be no exception, of course, kicking it off with my guest, Johnny Christmas. Johnny has worked with some of my other guests on the show, notably Ed Brisson, who is the writer of both Iron Fist and Old Man Logan for Marvel Comics. They both collaborated on Sheltered and Murder Book, and Johnny also worked with Margaret Atwood, author of The Handmaiden's Tale. They worked on the trilogy Angel Catbird. And now Johnny has an original graphic novel coming out, Firebug, through Image Comics. Firebug began in the magazine Island, a quarterly magazine, now defunct. The story was finished and collected into one graphic novel, Firebug, coming out March 7th. Johnny and I talk about that book, the road to collecting it as a graphic novel, some of the changes that he needed to make, plus how he's going about promoting the graphic novel. We also talk about the creative process, since this is Creator Talks after all, and we talk about some of the obstacles that Johnny has faced during his career and how he overcame them. It is an inspiring story to all of us, and to those of you who are creators, how to build objectives to overcome some of those obstacles that you face. And of course, we cover questions about rest and relaxation, the island book of his choice, and his beverage of choice. If you like what you hear, please rate and review on iTunes. It goes a long way to help the show. Let's get on with my conversation with Johnny Christmas, both the writer and artist of the graphic novel Firebug through Image Comics, here now on Creator Talks. Johnny, welcome to Creator Talks. Hey, how's it going, Christopher? It's going well, and I appreciate your rescheduling. I scheduled our interview on Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm not a big sports fan, so that date did not occur to me that that's when the Super Bowl fell. I'm okay with sports. I just don't follow it fanatically. And, Johnny, did you watch the Super Bowl at all? Were you into sports at all? Uh, I'm into advertising, so uh, I <laughs> Mostly for the ads, but I did I did catch the game in between uh, ads. Okay, yeah, I had the sound off, and I did see the ads, which I was glad I did too, because there were some brilliant ones out there. Uh, it was a good game. I mean, whether you were into football or not, it was a good game. A lot of yeah, back and it was. forth. Exciting. Before we get to your latest work, Firebug, I do want to touch upon a few milestones in your career, key events uh, that would be of interest to my listeners to get an idea about you and your work and how you approach it. You started out in comics working on a web comic, Spectre of Sound, and that was your first time you wrote and drew. The story. You did everything soup to nuts on that one. When you worked on that, what did you come to realize were your strengths in storytelling and what things did you want to work hard on refining as you went along? What was really helpful, brevity became really important in realizing just how much you need to cut. So I needed to sharpen up the storytelling aspect and get to the point a lot quicker. That was a real gift of doing a webcomic because you just don't have the time or like it's not like a 600 page graphic novel. You have to give a tasty bit and then you wait. And so you got to keep people engaged. So you got to get to it. That was the most important thing that I learned. In it. I haven't read that one. So did that come out on a weekly basis? <laughs> yeah, I had this like ridiculous idea. I was going to drop it daily, actually, just like brand new daily, uh, seven days a week. So I banked it for like a month and then I started dropping them relentlessly. I think I got 30 in. And then I was going to take another break and start dropping them again. I think maybe Shelter came through at that point. So then uh, that was the end of Spectre of Sound. Is that still just on the web right now? If it's even on the web right now. <laughs> that might be why I haven't read it. <laughs> I might have tried. I don't remember. You mentioned Sheltered, and you collaborated and co-created that with Ed Brisson as well as Murder Book. And I've spoken to Ed on the show. Uh, we talked about his writing Iron Fist and Old Man Logan for Marvel, and I've met him at Heroes Con. Super nice guy, very enthusiastic, gives you 100% of his attention. What was it like for you working with Ed, and what did you learn about each other during your collaboration? It was really good working with Ed. We both came to comics professionally a bit later than other people, and uh, we were both very serious. We were full-on adults, <laughs> so... Uh, so we're taking it very seriously. It was really refreshing to have someone who was like as um, serious about it as I was. We just tackled it. We just like really went for it. It was good having a partner that saw it the same way. Yeah. So we uh, we, we sent off a pitch. It took me a long time to read his work actually because I knew him as a letter, and uh, he did uh, this short story. And he was like, "Hey, read my stuff." And I was like, uh. And then I finally got around to reading the first murder book and a short story he did in Acts of Violence. And I was thinking, wow, this is really, this is really good because I fully intended on just uh, never drawing stuff that anyone else wrote. 
But um, I thought it would be fun to do a murder book story with him. We were gearing up to do a five-pager, and I thought that was going to be it. But then he suggested, like, hey, you want, you want to pitch something to Image and see how that goes? We could do five pages of that. And I was like, all right, yeah, let's give it a shot. And that was a pitch for something that didn't happen, but it got us pretty far along the chain at Skybound. So we decided to do it again, and that was sheltered. There were two points in your career when you chose to step away from comics. The first, when you're working as a graphic designer, you just lost the desire. Now, I experienced the same thing as a reader in the early 80s. I just stepped away from them because I just, I don't know, I just kind of kind of got bored. And bad timing because shortly after I stepped out, Burns got his run on FF, Miller's Daredevil, Simonson's Store. You know, looking back, I was like, duh, I should have just hung in there. Why did you lose the passion when you started working as a graphic designer? What was missing for you? I hadn't yet fully discovered indie comics yet. Um, I, I was reading some image, but for the most part, I was just kind of popping in with big two stuff. So Hellboy kind of was my rock and uh, loved Savage Dragon. But everything else was kind of, I, this is not scientifically uh, observed or anything, but this is just like anecdotal. But it seemed to me that every five years, there was like a cycle reset where you'd see the same stories happening again in big two things. Like, you know, um, they'd kill someone, they'd come back. It'd be the same sort of thing. And I just kind of just wasn't interesting anymore. So I, I kind of stepped away from it. And, and it wasn't until I started digging further into indie comics that I realized that there was something there for me. There was a space where I could tell stories that were unique as well. You know, I think that's what also got me back into comics. I mean, when I first came back in, I was buying the books that I bought before. And I think I was just at that stage in my life where there were other interests. But I agree with you that now with the indie comics and smaller publishers, I buy so many of their books because it's a mini series, a maxi series. It's something new. It's not usually tied to anything else. So I find it very accessible. I don't feel there's a whole lot of baggage there. Usually there's no baggage at all or history. So it's easier for me to get into it. And I think for a lot of readers who have come into comics, it's easier to get into. Although I still buy my old favorites, usually following a creative team than a character so much. But I can see exactly what you mean, that there's just more there in terms of the type of comic, the subject matter that you can cover outside of the intellectual properties of the big two. Exactly. I feel like... Um... I just kind of wait it out. Like every now and then someone will tell me, oh, a story from X character happening right now at the big two. And at that point, word of mouth will get to me and then I'll, I'll check it out. But to keep on going at it, to keep reading the same thing in hopes of a miracle, doesn't make any sense when every month there's a miracle happening in that image. Every month there's a, a miracle happening at Dark Horse or at, a, you know, Self-Made Hero or wherever else, Fanographics, Top Shelf. There's all this like incredible new stuff that you couldn't even predict because that someone's been pulled up crafting this beautiful masterpiece for years, and then they just drop it on you out the blue. It's 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 a wonderful time to be reading comics. And um, yeah, there's just a lot of variety, and I'm, I'm glad to partake in that stuff. And it's killing me, because uh, <laughs> I don't have a budget. <laughs> I try to, uh, but yeah, I buy so much because I like so much, and it's nice to sit down with your pile of books and go, you know, this all this stuff is different. Uh, a good variety of writers and artists that I really enjoy. And I don't look at anything very rarely and say, uh, I'm going to read this last. I'm not really that into it because it just doesn't stay in the pile. It's like, okay, where do I start? You know, <laughs> good problem to have. Now, there was another time you chose to step away from comics after a personal tragedy and how you dealt with it was inspirational. If you would please uh, share what happened, how you dealt with the grief and why you decided on a five-year plan to return to comics. I was married and uh, my wife was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer and uh, has since passed away. Uh, so I just didn't really know what to do with myself. I just kind of, I don't know, just uh, worked at a warehouse. I just kind of, I don't know, I, I was just trying to figure it out, uh, moving day to day. And uh, at a certain point I figured, okay, I'm gonna try and just really go hard on comics. So that's the one thing that held my interest. You know, when, when nothing is, interesting to you and life doesn't have much uh sweetness left to it you just gravitate to whatever light is there the only thing i had kind of attracted me was comics so i took a year off of everything and then after that i, I thought okay let me give myself five years to do comics and I, and I gave myself these really strict signposts so like uh be a professional comic artist in a year be uh you know do this and that at year two have this at year three which was like really insane, but I was, you know, like, what did I have to lose? I had nothing. 
I had everything to gain, but nothing to lose. So I just went hard and um, it all kind of panned out. Uh, shelter got picked up, I think, nine months into the first year. Everything just sort of fell into place after that. And I've been pretty fortunate with my career thus far. And Yeah, and I think giving myself a hard deadline was and something to focus on, anything, was um, instrumental to picking up the pieces, as they say. Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic plan. I mean, to have set a goal like that with milestones is really important because we all want to get somewhere with something that we're working on, either at work or a personal project or something like that. And if you don't set realistic goals that you know you can hit along the way and just say, I'm going to get from A to B in this time with nothing in between, uh, you know, it's going to be disappointing. So you got to set those smaller road marks along the way that you can try to hit and make them realistic. That's what I do when it works for me. And, you know, rather than just saying, I'm going to be at this point, you know, in two years. And there's a lot in between to get there. But I think that's good advice for anybody. Have a plan. No matter what you're doing, have a plan and set realistic goals. And so it's by no stroke of luck that you were so successful, although you have to be at the right place at the right time. Luck plays into it. Luck is basically, so you just prepare yourself as well as you can and just be prepared and then hope to get lucky <laughs> that, that you can sort of squeeze your way through the, the cracks. But you got to be ready for that opportunity. The opportunity is all luck, but the preparation is all in your hands. One more book I wanted to touch upon before we get to Firebug. You connected with Margaret Atwood, uh, the Canadian poet, who wrote The Handmaiden's Tale, and that's also been a movie and a Netflix series. And you two collaborated on three volumes of Angel Catbird. So please help me place this in context of your work. Yeah, it was a no, actually, what happened was when I was working on um, Sheltered, Brandon had the idea of Island Magazine, and he came to me and asked if I wanted to do a, a short or, or one of the stories in Island. I said, great, yeah, this would be wonderful. Uh, so I got started on that, and then Angel Capper came through, and it was just a wonderful opportunity to work with Margaret. And the creative process with everyone is different, and half the joy I find in comics is engaging in a creative process with your collaborator. Um, just kind of seeing what they dream up or what they throw your way, it could be exhilarating. So... We uh, started on Catbird and I put Firebug kind of on hold. I was doing it a little bit at the same time. And then I would take uh, between volumes of uh, Catbird, I take, you know, like a month or so off. And then I just like slam through a bunch of Firebug and then back on Angel Catbird for the next graphic novel. Take another break, slam through a bunch of Firebug. And then after the last one that I just like went full tilt on what was left with uh, Firebug. But the thing was between... Uh, the star firebug and picking it up again full time. There was a uh, island uh, went away, so firebug became a graphic novel instead of a episodic thing. So I had to do quite a bit of rewriting. I think the story was stronger for it, and I'm I'm grateful that it is the graphic novel that it is. I'm not happy that island's gone, but you know, so it goes. Quite a bit of uh, shifting things around for firebug and making it what it is uh, in the landscape that was provided. Okay, so as you started to assemble this as a graphic novel, given that Island went away, uh, there were some pages and some subplots that were omitted. For example, like the Word of God, I don't think was in your original plan for the story. And you prefer longer form stories in general. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, a true statement. With complete creative control, why did you pick those things to leave out? You certainly had the space to flesh it out in the OGN if you wanted to and make it longer. Yeah, I just didn't want to get to um, one of those situations where uh, you have that stack of uh, <laughs> that script that gets longer and longer and longer. It started to become that. Firebug originally was going to be 100 pages, and that was it. And at a certain point, I found myself going north of 120 pages, and that started to worry me. <laughs> so I went back in and I thought, okay, like, brevity is the soul of wit. Let's just start razoring off some things. And I just started killing my darlings. If it wasn't absolutely essential to the plot, then it was on the chopping block. Because some of the stuff would have just been awesome to draw and just so much fun. It would be serving myself and not the reader. That's when you're starting to get in the dangerous territory of the storyteller, I think. Now, would you say you have enough there that wound up on the cutting room floor? You could take some of those elements and possibly continue the story later and address some of those ideas. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If I do more Firebug to maybe do it, but I'll have to reassess and see what that story needs instead of just you warning them in. Though I really want to get some of that stuff in, but uh, a lot of times you really have to see, uh, play the ball where it lays, as they say, and pick up the story. So we'll see. We'll see if any of that stuff ever sees the light of day. But um, even just writing it out and drawing some of it, just going through the process 
help the final product. Because sometimes seeing what all can be gives you reassurance. Like if you got a lot of strong stuff on a cutting room floor, probably have a lot of strong stuff, shorter, better than longer if you can. Now, if you can continue on with the story, you had plenty of time to put together this OJM because you started doing it serialized in Island Magazine. Now, if you were to come back and do another story, would you do it as another graphic novel or would you want to break it into chapters, say, single copies instead of a full volume? Uh, That's a really good question and something I'm sort of uh, considering now. Doing it in single issues is really great advertising. Every month we have a, like a reminder that this thing is happening and people see it along the way and they can get it as a graphic novel in the end. But since it is coming out as a graphic novel, um, staying true to the, uh, the format in which it first arrived is probably the most sensible thing to do, but we'll see. You know, it might not be the most sensible. It might just be the most, uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see, we'll see. Um, uh, right now, in my heart, I'm thinking uh, another graphic novel, but, you know, if, if it makes more sense to go single issue, then I'll, I'll do what's most sensible, if I do more at all. So there are several themes explored in the book, and I won't get into any spoilers, you know. I'll let you talk about the book as much as you want to, so I don't reveal anything, because I want people to read the book, of course. Uh, several themes explored. I'd like to expand on a couple of them. First, the volcano goddess. Her flame is passed down from generation to generation. She, To me, she's like a Jungian archetype in a way, a universal mythic character that's in everyone's unconscious mind. And maybe that's how superheroes were born and continue to perpetuate because they're calling back to mythological heroes and archetypes that we have in our mind. And it's helped us shape our individual selves in the culture. Am I just reading too much into the whole concept of Jungian archetypes and mythology? Or did your preparation for the book move you along those lines when establishing the character of the volcano goddess? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of mythology uh, and a lot of looking at archetypes and trying to find the most powerful way to tell the story. And a lot of times uh, relying on, on archetypes and the mythologies of the four are very helpful signposts uh, to show you if you're going in the right direction and let you know if you uh, need to double down, especially a story that's a fantasy. To really honor the tradition of fantasy storytelling, I wanted to really tap into the oldest fantasy stories of all, which are uh, myths that have been handed down. And another theme that you address, too, is the impact of civilization itself and advances in technology on what could be considered more the spiritual side of humanity. We all need to express that side in some way, either through a religion, a philosophy of life, or just through artistic expression to connect with that part of ourselves. In the story, the goddess has been reduced to a myth over the centuries. It kind of faded away as part of reality and just became, for many people, except for the inner cult, a mythological figure. She became less real. In fact, the cult of the goddess reduced a lot of the fire and magic the goddess had, which can happen in many organized religions where followers are more caught up in the trappings of the ritual itself versus as a a way to connect with the spiritual side or with a greater principle. Was there anything that you experienced that made you decide to address society's disconnect with the spiritual side through your graphic novel? It rings true. I'm uh, I'm not a very spiritual person, let's put that right out there, but I noticed that a lot of what we do and where we go in terms of the stuff that's inside is all very of the moment and very tactile and now, right? So there's not a lot of uh, self-reflection or examination. And uh, religion for a lot of people have, like that's been where a lot of people start that journey. So just observing the world around me, not with judgment, just, you know, it's just kind of what I see. I thought that would ring true in that story to most of the readers because that's very much like the world we live in now. It just has fire goddesses. Yeah, and I'm glad you addressed it and addressed it from that way through this fantasy story. And, you know, again, I'm not casting judgment about religion. I'm just saying that everyone has some time they need to reflect, to step back, to connect either with themselves or with their spiritual side, because we do get caught up in the trappings of the world and living day to day and all the noise and all the technology and responding to this tweet and everything that you just kind of lose yourself in just trying to keep up with everything. And you forget where culture came from, how, the things behind it. You're just so tied to technology, disconnect with the world and with other people for that matter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, I think if we were really uh, engaging with each other um, uh, a little bit more, I think things would be a lot more rewarding. We're very much new to 
this social way of engaging, there have been rewards in it. And they'll probably, uh, it'll probably yield more rewards. It's interesting to take a uh, note of this specific moment in history because it's never happened before. It'll probably never happen again. And it's quite interesting. Now, the book is dedicated to your mother, Constance. Why is that? A lot of times when you're telling a story, you don't really know what it's about. For me, anyway, I start with the characters and I just let them start leading the way. I, I have a, an idea of where the plot's going. I have that sort of uh, hashed out. But the, the characters will let me know whether that's true or not because they make the decisions. Um, and as I was going along, and themes are, are presented sort of in the same way. And as I was going along, I realized that a lot of it had a lot to do with mother-child relationship, which is not what I intended it as. Like, I, I didn't sit down and go, like, I'm going to tell them a story about parenthood. <laughs> as I was going further along, I realized just how important it was to Keegan as she kept speaking to me through her actions showing actually what was important. I thought, oh, wow, this is really about mothers. So I thought it was fitting to dedicate it to my mother. And let me ask you about the creative team. You have quite a team with you, Tamara Bonfion on coloring and Ariana Ma on letters. Now you must have assembled the team for this book, correct? Yeah. Did you discuss many of the book's themes with your creative team? And did they share any insights or ideas from their own experience that somehow worked into the story? Uh, no, it, it was pretty uh, compartmentalized in terms of the story aspects because I just kind of went off and tried to figure it out. I, I told them kind of what I wanted to convey, uh, the feeling I wanted to convey more than anything because I didn't have full nuts and bolts as we were going along because at the very start it was going to be episodic in Island. It's going to be uh, it's going to be much more poetic. <laughs> uh, whereas as, as a graphic novel, I wanted it to have a bit more page turny. But at the first iteration was going to be a, a lot more. Um, that first part in Island that came that was very action packed and dense was going to be like a teaser, and then it was going to like space way out and get like really poetic. So I, I told them I, I wanted a watercolory kind of effect and a sort of a brushy type effect. I reached out to Tamara and asked if uh, if it was possible, and she said she could do it, and it's amazing what she's done. And Ariana, I wanted a very um, I wanted a very human warm touch to the lettering as close to hand lettering as you can get i wanted the whole thing to have an emotional resonance the whole book i didn't want it to be one of those books that you like pick it up you read it and you go oh that was really cool and you just like walk away i want i want everyone to kind of walk away feeling something that connects as true to them in some form or fashion that's the hope anyway tamara's colors are fantastic especially the volcano and the fire goddess fire, it really lit up the page. And of course, the letterer too. Generally, you don't notice the letterers. You only notice it when something's wrong or something looks off or it obscures the art. But in this case, perfect fit. They're an excellent team to have. And one of the things I thought was interesting is that you did also give credit to the flatteners of the colors in the book, Fernando Argulo and Ludwig Olimba. You don't often see that. That's all credit to Tamara. As we were compiling everything and, and I sent... Tamara and Ariana, the credits page, Tamara was very, uh, said, hey, uh, do, you, do you credit flatters? And I was like, I don't know, do I credit flatters? <laughs> she was like, well, if you do here are the flatters. And I thought, well, what? well, if the colorist who works with the flatters wants to, because I, I don't have a relationship with the flatters, I don't know them, but Tamara does. And I'm sure they, they're, you know, flatters are quite instrumental to the work of colorists. A lot of what a colorist does is they'll get the files already sort of pre-selected and to save time, the flatter will go and pre-select all those areas and so that the colors can come on in, hit the ground running, and just, you know, um, make um, artistic choices from that point. So it, it's really um, it's a credit to the Tamara to share the credit with her uh, flatters. Yeah, their work's very important. Now, in the case of a, an OGN like yours, you have more time to kind of get things done. But on a monthly comic, it becomes critical because a lot of times those colors get the work last in the line and there's a quick turnaround time. So you need someone to help you prep the work and flatten the colors to kind of have it ready to go. Yeah, it's a very important job. And um, you also shared a thank you to Brandon Graham. Now, I believe he's done work for Image, too. Uh, what's your connection with Brandon? Well, Brandon spearheaded Island. Brandon was a guy who reached out to me and asked what that story would be. And, and I came to him and I said, hey, how about a volcano goddess story where, you know, this and that happened? And he said, great. If it wasn't for Brandon giving me the opportunity in Island, Firebug as it lives now and probably wouldn't exist in the way that it does and on top of that brandon is just the most generous comic book i know he loves comics more than like anybody i can think of off the top of my head he doesn't have competitive bone in his body he doesn't have um he's like the biggest cheerleader for comics 
And let's not forget the publishers and the editors. So what was their initial reaction to your pitch for the book as an OGN? Actually, uh, again, that's where uh, Brandon came in. He notified all the, you know, the Island team that Island was going away. And uh, so I was bummed out because I only got one chapter in because of my work with Angel Catbird. I, I got one chapter in and just as uh, chapter two was about to come out, I was like, hey, Brandon, chapter two is coming. He's like, oh, bad news. Island's going to be gone. So I was pretty bummed. But then he came back to me later and said, hey, uh, trying to find homes for a lot of the Island stories that didn't get put out in their full glory. He figured it out with Island, uh, with, uh, with Mitch to, to find a home for Firebug as a graphic novel. Well, you're very structured in your planning and worked in graphic design and you pay attention to advertising and you have a very strong campaign for this book to get the promotion for it out there. Tell me a bit about the promotional plan for Firebug. The promotional plan is, is mostly to get it into every can that I can. Uh, get people to, to read it, review it, check it out. Because I think the book, if I may say uh, humbly, I think it'll connect with a lot of people once it gets out there. The push is to, to have a strong one at, um, and to have perhaps a, a stronger reach towards a traditional book market than is usually the case with a lot of comics. You're looking at distribution and promotion through bookstores. Uh, since it's not a single comic, it's a graphic novel. But do you plan on doing any book signings or any tours, mini tours? I know you're up in Vancouver, but do you plan on going to bookstores in that area or convention signings or anything like that in the near future? So I'm going to do uh, Emerald City um, this year. So that's March 1st through 4th, which is right before the book actually uh, hits comic shops. But going to have the book out. So if anyone wants to advance to grab it before you know they can at their comic shop, I'm at Emerald City just to get some uh, readers to, to start talking about it before it, it hits the shops. And then uh, in Toronto, I'll be doing a uh, signing on uh, release day at uh, Page and Panel at the Toronto Reference Library. So that, that should be really exciting. Uh, 6 p.m. signing on the 7th. And then um, on, in Hamilton in Ontario, I'll be doing the next day on March 8th, I'll be signing copies as well. And then I'm going to go to Amalgam Comics in Philly, which which I'm very excited to do, and uh, do a talk and a signing there as well on the 10th, um, which will be a Saturday. And, uh, and uh, I'll be doing a signing here in uh, Vancouver at, uh, on I think March 25th uh, at Pulp Fiction Books. Um, that'll be our Vancouver launch of Firebug. Are those dates going to be on your website, or how do we see that list of tour dates? There, uh, most of them are already up on the, on the website right now. Go to Johnny Christmas. Dot com and uh, in the appearances section, you can uh, see where I'm going to be. Okay, well, I'll put that in the podcast notes. So, folks, when you look at the notes about the show, there'll be a link to all that information. So, if you can connect with Johnny and get a chance to say hello, uh, take a look at those dates and see if you can fit it into your schedule. Absolutely. Please do. Please come by. And now I just have my fun questions for my guests. And you probably are familiar with these since you've heard the show. Rest and relaxation. What do you like to do for rest and relaxation? I don't know what rest or relaxation. <laughs> um, I like to walk. I'm a big walker. I like to empty my mind and just sort of see what I see. I like to read, of course. So yeah, walking, reading, seeing movies, getting a drink with friends. If you were stuck on a deserted island and you only had one book with you, and it can be a graphic novel, it doesn't have to be prose, but it, you know, either way, what would that one book be? Uh, I would say uh, Love in a Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I uh, love magical realism. His novels are probably, they're, they're way up there in my favorite uh, objects of art. And when you're off the island and you're resting relaxed, when you have a chance, what is your beverage of choice? <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, as you know, uh, these sort of things flux. Uh, they, they change around from season to season. So uh, right now, I'd, I'd say, uh, gee, I'd say an old-fashioned or uh, maybe a grony, but I like a, I like a good beer. I'm a beer guy. I like a, an IPA. I like a Saison. Now, see, that's what I go for is the IPAs generally. I've said this many times on the show, and people know I like the red wine, and my wife and I can both enjoy that. Or, you know, Guinness. If for me, if it's just, if I'm just having a drink for me, it's going to be something like an IPA, for sure. It's just so refreshing, crisp, perfect. And it's wonderful because there's so many to choose from now. I love the way that a craft brews have exploded over the past few decades, and there's just so much to choose from. It's, it's fun. You know, I have to go out and try something new and get a small glass and try it out and, you know, expand my horizons, <laughs> as it were. Uh, where where are you? Where are you located? I am located in Wilmington, Delaware, not too far from Philly, actually. Okay, right on. Uh, what's the uh, craft brewing scene where you are? Oh, it's very strong. Uh, where I'm located, 
there are several microbrews around me, pubs, and Dogfish Head is the, I guess, is the main beer of Delaware uh, located downstate. I'm sure you've seen that one. Twin Lakes is here. Uh, Fordham's not too far from here. There's a whole bunch. I mean, it's just many, many, but probably the the longest running and first one, one of the first craft brews was Dogfish Head. So I tend to like a 60-minute IPA. Um, I like the 90-minute IPA. It's very good if I'm not doing anything. Um, a friend and I went to a show yesterday, and he wanted a 120. I said, I want to stay awake for the show, so I'm not going to have a 120. <laughs> but they they always serve you like an 8-ounce glass of that because it's very strong. Very good. So it's uh, it's my favorite brand probably, and they're not paying me to say that. So there's uh, brass neck brewing. There's lots of um, – uh, if I start, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop with all <laughs> – I'm just going to leave it there. But, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of amazing things been springing up all over town. Over the past couple of years, it's been a beer drinker's renaissance. I've been to Canada a couple times, and I was up in Toronto around 2010 with my wife for a seminar. And we did a little tour of Toronto, and there is a brewery up there. And I, as far as I know, it's still there. Uh, Steam Whistle oh, yeah. Yeah. is a Pilsner, and we actually got a tour. They were full, but they said, oh, we'll fit you in. And we're like, gee, thanks so much. And we got a really nice tour of the brewery. Canadians, man. It's, it's the loveliest place on earth. Everyone- <laughs> I'll never forget because the tour guide looked and reminded me in mannerisms of Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> so I felt like I was getting a tour by Jimmy Fallon. And then afterwards, you had a sample of the beer in your little glass, and I still have it. So, uh, yeah, it was a highlight of the trip. Really enjoyed that. Awesome. Now, if they made an action figure of you, what would your accessory be? <laughs> I think that's the best question I've ever been asked. Uh, oh, my goodness. What would my accessory be? Jeez Louise. Um, uh, that's worse than the island book, isn't it? <laughs> I had an accessory would be a, a, probably an inking brush or a pencil, which is not very exciting. I, I know as I say it. Um, so I, I need to, uh, I need to start taking up motorcycle racing or something really awesome. So I <laughs> a better accessory. Cause come on, man, really? Like, cause that's truthfully, that's what it would probably be. Um, I got to figure some things out, man. Yeah. I, you know, for myself, I have no idea what I would say is my accessory. I mean, it depends, you know, uh, time of day, uh, what I'm doing. But for me, it's become just basically a little notebook that I carry around with me. So when uh, I'm thinking about who I want to interview or what I want to ask, I just sit there and start scribbling down notes. I'm always seen with that if I'm hanging out someplace, you know, grabbing a coffee, grabbing a drink. I'm sitting there writing, just thinking through things. So that's, I guess for now, it's my accessory. Plus, I like to get back to pen and ink and not always be working on the computer. Because I'm on it all day for work, and we're working on podcasts, so it's nice to get back to that feeling of just writing, you know. Yeah, uh, I love hearing the sound of lead on paper. Uh, <laughs> like it's like very, it's very soft, but it's the biofeedback in your hand and like the slight hearing of like the lead dragging across the paper. Like I, I was drawing digitally for quite uh, a little bit, and I've switched back to drawing traditionally just so I can kind of reconnect a little bit and have a little bit less screen time. Now, it is nice to reconnect with the physical implements of drawing and writing. Uh, I miss that. So, uh, yeah, it's fun to do it. Well, Johnny, I know the book's coming out March 7th, so uh, look forward to seeing that come out. And everybody should check it out. Beautifully written, beautifully drawn, a lot of great themes explored. Uh, just a really solid read, and it's all in a graphic novel, all one and done, so you're not going to be left hanging. You can read through it and get the entire experience all at once. So, Johnny, thanks so much for being on Creator Talks. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Christopher. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Johnny Christmas. It was just one of those things where we had difficulty with our Skype connection, but things did work out okay. We did learn a little bit more about Johnny and his upcoming graphic novel, Firebug, coming out this week. I will say that given that I speak to people all over the globe, I'm pretty happy with the service. You know, things have gone pretty well with Skype and with my recording equipment. I can't really complain. I've only had just a couple of difficulties, and most of them have been transparent to you, the audience, and I hope to keep it that way. Now, before closing, I just want to update you on a few projects that guests that have been on the show are working on right now. First up is Ron Randall, who was on episode 11 of Creator Talks. He is working on the next chapter of Mercy St. Clair's Adventures called Chapel Town. It is a Kickstarter. It's going to be at least 96 pages. That's before the first stretch goal is reached. And it has about 20 days left. So to keep bringing fans new stories of Mercy St. Clair, this is going to be how it's done, is through Kickstarter. So uh, please support Ron, check out the Kickstarter, and pledge whatever you can. Every little bit helps. Another Kickstarter ongoing with about 12 days left to go are by my former guest John Sims and Lee Mylewski, who are in episode number 56. 
They are working on part two of the three-part Dissension, the sci-fi space horror story. So you'll want to check that one out and do what you can to help support it. And if you're listening to this podcast on the Thursday that it drops, there's about one day left to jump on board Amazing Age Zero. This is the Zero issue that was going to be part of Free Comic Book Day, but Diamond would not accept it. So Matthew David Smith, who was on episode 64, is turning to Kickstarter to make this book happen. So for all three, pledge whatever you can. Every little bit helps. And also check out the podcast if you don't know anything about the books to see what they're all about and what the creators are all about. Coming up next week, Jordan Hart talking about his comic book, Doppelganger, being published by one of my favorite publishers, Alterna Comics. Their books are on newsprint for just $1.50, so don't miss it. Thank you for joining me for Creator Talks this week. The show is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and also on Amazon Echo and Dot Devices. Just say, Alexa, play podcast Creator Talks to hear the latest episode. In addition, you can listen to the show and follow it through Podbean. Your feedback is greatly appreciated, so please rate and review on iTunes if you like the show or an episode that you heard. Your ratings and reviews go a long way to helping the show, and I can't thank you enough for taking a bit of time to do that. For your convenience, in the show notes of each podcast, I have a link to my iTunes page where you can rate and review the show and see the entire list of shows available. If you haven't heard them all, take a look through. There are living legends and -and up-and-coming comic creators. Tell family and friends who like comics and comic book creators about the show. And to subscribe. The content is free. Just as valued are your comments and feedback. You can reach me through Facebook and Twitter at Creator Talks Pod. That's at Creator Talks Pod. You can also reach out to me by email. You can find that at my website, CreatorTalks.com. At the website, you will also find blog posts, reviews of books that I have read that you might want to read too, my catalog of podcasts, and videos and other written articles on the website, CreatorTalks.com. A hearty thank you to all my guests. It is an honor and a privilege for you to make time to be on the show and talk to me about your work. It is your knowledge and insight into the creative process that makes the show so unique. My thanks also goes out to my family who makes this show possible, especially my executive co-producer, Mrs. Calloway. I'll be back each and every Thursday with a new interview. For Creator Talks, I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time.